Have you ever had a good view of the Milky Way from way out in the countryside? It's a spectacular sight, and it's a sight you'll never get from a place like this. Hi, I'm Eric Dunn, and as an astronomer I can tell you there's a lot of similarity between a city and a galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is a huge metropolis of stars, full of bright lights, dynamic action, and dark mysteries. There's also a connection between you and the Milky Way, and you can find out what it is on the next Cosmic Highway. We'll make you feel right at home in the Galactic City, right here on the Discovery Channel. We're trying to figure out where we are. Well, not just where we are, but what kind of place this is. And it's more difficult than you may think. Hi, I'm Eric Dunn. And I'm Ken Hewitt-White. Trying to see any city well from ground level is difficult because, well, the nearby parts tend to block your view. As we walk along here, for example, we can't tell if we're looking at a town of a thousand people or if we're in a city of 10 million people. We just can't see beyond the buildings. One way of getting a better view, of course, would be to gain a little elevation. Well, from up here, the view is just a whole lot better. We can see the downtown core of the city, clusters of buildings all over the place, and a long way out to the suburbs. The only thing that can improve this view is if we could get up even higher for a better vantage point. In a sense, that's what we do when we consult a map. You're looking at a drawing of the city from the ideal viewing spot, high in the air, looking straight down. The situation with the Milky Way is similar, but even worse. Nearby stars block our view of more distant stars. And the problem with the Milky Way is that we can't get above it like this to get that better vantage point. Worse yet, nobody has ever made a good map of the Milky Way, although they are trying. So join us on the Cosmic Highway as we visit those who have taken on the greatest challenge in all of map making, charting the Milky Way. We're in Victoria, British Columbia, at the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. Some of the pioneering studies of the Milky Way galaxy took place here more than 70 years ago. Let's go inside. This is the observatory's 1.8 meter reflecting telescope. It's loaded with all sorts of sophisticated electronics and it's slave to computer control. But in the early days, it was run entirely by hand. And, as you can see, it responds readily to the human touch. It's named after John Stanley Plaskett, who in 1917 became the observatory's first director. At the time, this was the biggest telescope on Earth. Dr. Plaskett and his crew used this telescope to become among the first astronomers in the world to measure the motions and structure of the Milky Way galaxy. Plaskett's small but dedicated group measured the velocity and direction of motion for hundreds of stars to show that the galaxy rotates as a single system. The work garnered Plaskett and the observatory international recognition. Meanwhile, American astronomer Harlow Shapley made a key announcement about the position of Earth inside the Milky Way. Shapley was surveying objects called globular star clusters. These celestial chandeliers contain thousands of stars yet the objects appear small and dim in the sky. Shapley measured their distances and learned that they're farther out than the stars in the Milky Way. Strangely, a large proportion of the clusters are grouped in the summer sky near the constellation Sagittarius. It dawned on Shapley that the globular clusters surround the Milky Way and that we see most of the clusters near Sagittarius because the hub of our galaxy is located in that direction. Shapley declared that we're in the galactic outskirts, looking in. He was right. From his measurements, Shapley inferred a size for the galaxy of 300,000 light-years. But here he was wrong. His estimate was too big by a factor of three. In fact, Shapley erroneously believed the Milky Way was so large, it contained everything in the universe. These ideas had philosophical ramifications. Earth had already been dethroned once from its pre-Renaissance position at the center of the solar system. 
Now it was being shunted to one side of the Milky Way. And to Shapley, the Milky Way was the whole universe. Today, we realize the Milky Way is just one of countless galaxies, some of them shaped like ours, scattered throughout the universe. I often use an analogy with, the, with young school kids when I talk to them. I ask the class, if they're sort of uh, five or six or ten-year-olds, how long they're going to live, and there's usually a big discussion. And eventually, we, we settle on around 100 years. So I tell them, if I just draw a circle on the board, and I tell them, well, you're starting off on one edge of this circle, and you go at the fastest possible speed, which is the speed of light in this mythical spaceship of, that we're talking about. And I hold up my finger and said, you're going to get about this far across the galaxy, which is this big, before you die. Let's do a little galactic observing of our own. The Milky Way is more than just stars. Sheets of hydrogen gas drift in the vast spaces between the stars. These collect into gigantic but rarefied hydrogen clouds, such as the Orion Nebula, where stars are born. Growing out of these gaseous nurseries are families of brilliant young stars, such as the Pleiades Cluster in Taurus. Others, such as the globular clusters we've already seen, are crowded assemblies of very ancient stars. Old stars become unstable in their final years. Some, like the famous Ring Nebula, blow off their outer layers. The Helix Nebula is another giant smoke ring whose parent star, called a white dwarf, is the shriveled remains of what was once a normal star. Other, more massive stars blow up in cataclysmic supernova explosions, their twisted wreckage spreading outward like that of the Crab Nebula. Everywhere astronomers look, they see the fantastically shaped, richly colored denizens of deep space. Unfortunately, we see mostly only those Milky Way objects that are relatively close to us. Earth is at ground level in a suburban neighborhood of the galactic city. From our house near the outskirts of town, we can't see much beyond our own backyard. Part of our problem is that the galactic city contains a kind of smog made up of interstellar dust and gas. This thin but pervasive cosmic pollution collects in the spiral arms. There it creates a galaxy-wide dust lane that clogs up our line of sight along the Milky Way. Ironically, we can peer out to the universe at large and plainly see the dusty lanes in other galaxies. Our star system is hardly unusual. So the dilemma facing astronomers is, how do we map the Milky Way if we can't see all of it? The answer is, don't just look, listen. The ghostly glow of the Milky Way may not catch your attention if you live anywhere near a modern city, but to ancient peoples it was virtually an everyday sight. Oh, all right, a virtually every night sight then. The point is that the Milky Way found its way into myths and legends from around the world. The ancient Greek version has it that the Milky Way is actually a milk stain. It seems that the goddess Juno was having trouble nursing an uncooperative baby Hercules. There was one of those messy accidents, and her divine milk sprayed out across the sky and left that stain that you can still see up there. In a lot of other cultures, though, the Milky Way was seen as a celestial river. And in China, it was Tianhou. The Chinese sun god had a daughter known as the Weaver Maid. She fell in love with a lowly cowherder. It was a marriage made in heaven, so to speak, except that the two lovers became so wrapped up in each other that they neglected their royal duties. The son banished the cowherd to one side of the Milky Way and called his daughter back to work on the other. But the gods took pity on the couple, at least a little. They made a deal whereby the two could meet on one day every year. On the seventh day of the seventh month each year, 
all the magpies in China, they say, flock to the celestial river and make a bridge with their open wings so the couple can walk across. The leading characters of this story are still up there, still on either side of the Milky Way. We know the weaver girl as Vega and the cowherd as Altair. The Chinese folklorists tell us that these two bright stars get a little closer together every year on July the 7th. They also say that if it clouds up and rains later that day, it's the sad couple crying at the prospect of being separated for another year. This curious environment looks rather like the place where old telephone poles go to die. But in fact, it's a kind of radio telescope, a vast antenna that collects radio waves from outer space. This particular antenna that works at very low frequencies isn't in use anymore, but they do have more conventional radio dishes on this site. Some of them are doing cutting-edge research. This is the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory in southern British Columbia, and we've come here to listen to the Milky Way. When mapping the Milky Way, there is a solution to the galactic smog problem. Think of a sunset on a hazy summer's evening. It glows red because shorter blue wavelengths are absorbed in the atmosphere near the horizon. The longer red wavelengths get through. So it is with the galaxy. The interstellar dust and gas don't block the longer wavelengths. Too bad our eyes don't operate at those longer wavelengths. But radio antennas do. They've opened a new window to the galaxy because they're sensitive to the longer wavelengths. In a manner of speaking, they can see where optical telescopes can't. However, good radio maps haven't been around for very long. It begins in the 60s when radio astronomers were able for the first time to see the Milky Way in its entirety. They were able to see past the buildings in the city, in your analogy, and were able to look at the structure of the whole Milky Way. The, the dust which, which prevents optical telescopes from seeing much of the structure is completely transparent to radio telescopes. Radio astronomers were the first to understand the structure of the Milky Way. In the 1950s and 60s, their observations of simple hydrogen were used to map the overall structure and motion of the galaxy at a greater depth than Plaskett ever could have done. Hydrogen gas is a naturally occurring broadcast station in the galactic city. It's a fundamental, pervasive component, and radio telescopes can detect it easily. The early radio maps, though coarse and incomplete, hint at the Milky Way's complex spiral structure. In the 1970s and 80s, optical and radio astronomers combined their observations of giant nebulas to produce more detailed maps. By carefully estimating their distances, Astronomers use these nebulas as bright tracers of spiral structure. The curving galactic neighborhoods were taking form. Now the researchers at Penticton are adding to this picture by employing a rather unusual telescope in a project they call the Galactic Plane Survey. This is one of the strangest rail lines in the world. There are no trains that run along here, but there are radio dishes that slide back and forth along these tracks. This is what's called an aperture synthesis array, a curious kind of radio telescope that enables astronomers to synthesize the effect of a radio telescope far larger than they could ever afford to build. This kind of configuration gives reasonable detail over a fairly wide patch of sky, and that makes it ideal for such tasks as mapping the Milky Way. Despite the daylight and the clouds and inclement weather, this telescope is mapping the Milky Way at this very moment. The survey's a big undertaking for us. We're surveying um, what looks like a big strip of the Milky Way to us, but is actually a fairly small fraction of it, about a quarter of the visible Milky Way from the Northern Hemisphere, and that's a five-year project for us. Five years of round-the-clock operation for the telescope. So the telescope has to be automatic. It, it's run by computers lots of computers in there and they have to work for us happily day and night. We have chosen a region in the outer galaxy because it's a bit simpler. When you look towards the center of the city you have a very long line of sight. Um, although we can see the buildings are transparent to us in a sense on any line of sight in that direction to the downtown core there are lots and lots of buildings. It's a bit hard to disentangle. 
Our destination is the dark cone, which is just above a small but intense cluster of bright stars. The stars are radiating so much energy, they're blowing a conical hole through the surrounding interstellar gas and dust. The Penticton astronomers have aptly named this feature a galactic chimney. The chimney allows material to escape into the galaxy's outer halo, at least for a few billion years until it settles back down into various regions of the Milky Way. Galactic chimneys help recycle elements throughout the galaxy, replenishing interstellar space with the building blocks for new stars and planets. The observatory's Aperture Synthesis Telescope is uniquely designed to chart these expansive objects in detail, and the Galactic Plane Survey is bound to discover more objects like it. Welcome to downtown in the big city. The concentration of buildings and people is much greater here in the central business district. There's a lot going on, too. Old buildings being torn down, new ones coming up, high-energy transactions taking place. This is where the action is. And it's the same way with galaxies, too, in a sense. Our downtown Milky Way is crowded with energetic stars and strange sights, as we'll soon see. Hi, welcome to my backyard. This is the part of the show where I like to describe what you can see in the sky at night. But this time around, we have a little problem. You see, most backyard astronomers live in the city, and if that's you, you're badly placed for watching the Milky Way. Sorry about that, there's not much I can do. But there is something you can do. If you take the time to drive out into the country on a dark, clear night, then you can scan the Milky Way with this simple set of binoculars. And if you do that, you might be surprised at what you see. To see the Milky Way, you'll need a crisp, clear evening with no moonlight and, of course, no streetlights. In the winter, the Milky Way is pretty subtle. The best place to look is high in the southern sky, to the left, or east, of the constellation Orion. We call it the Orion Arm of the Milky Way galaxy. And in terms of galactic geography, the Orion Arm is the name of our solar system's neighborhood. In summer, the Milky Way is spectacular. It arches from northeast to southwest late on July and August evenings. When you look up from the northeast, from the constellations Perseus and Cassiopeia to Cygnus high in the south, you're looking towards the outer spiral arms of the Milky Way, the galactic city limits. Summer or winter, be sure to scan the full length of the Milky Way with your binoculars. And also today, there's lots of small telescopes available that don't have very much magnification, but have a nice wide field of view. You just sort of cradle them in your arm like this and cruise along the Milky Way. And when you do that, you'll come across lots of misty nebulas and sparkling star clusters. So, take it from me, stargazing in the sticks can be a lot of fun. Remember, the best way to see the Milky Way is to get out of town. No one has ever seen the exact center of the galaxy. It's hidden from view by dust and gas and densely packed stars. But astronomers have clues to what's happening there. Recent observations indicate that a huge black hole lurks at the Milky Way's hub. We can't see the black hole itself, but we can detect the way its gravity affects nearby stars. We've recently found that stars in the inner region of the hub are in rapid motion around the powerful gravitational field of the black hole. They've measured how quickly the stars are moving across the line of sight. So if you take a series of pictures spaced in time and look at them, you discover that this star is here in the first picture, and there in the next picture, and there in the next picture, and you figure out how quickly it's moving. And the stars are moving, it appears, at more than a thousand kilometers per second in the central mm, hundredths of a parsec, hundredths of a light year, roughly speaking. And they've constructed a little mo movie of how the next 50 years of evolution in this little central thing is going to look. And you can see the individual stars move. In one case, there's a binary. That's very comforting that they can see binaries. And in the other cases, the stars are moving around the center. And they're moving around the center very quickly. Now, this is pretty remarkable when you think about it. Stars don't move, right? 
Stars are, have velocities, of course, but they're so far apart and so far away from us that they basically look practically stationary. And yet in the center of our galaxy, the stars are moving so quickly that in the lifetime of one of us, we're going to see the center rotate all the way around. That's a very remarkable observation and a very remarkable graphic. Now, obviously, there's an awful lot more to the big city than what first meets the eye. Most people have no idea how much of the city is out of sight below street level. A complete understanding of the metropolis is impossible without looking down here. And, as it turns out, there's a vast, unseen component to the Milky Way galaxy as well. Well, the evidence that there is a lot of dark matter out there is really overwhelming. Um, if we look at the way galaxies such as our own rotate, um, we find this rotating rather quickly and on a very large scale. And something has to be holding it together, preventing it from flying apart. And the only force we know about is the force of gravity. And we can calculate, using the laws of physics, how much mass there has to be in order to have enough gravitational field to hold the galaxy together. And it turns out that the amount of mass needed is about 10 times greater than the mass of all of the stars and gas that we can see directly. And it's that difference, that factor of 10 extra mass, that we call the dark matter. It's the matter we know has to be there, but which we can't see. Now, there's a dimension to the galaxy that we haven't talked about, and that's the fourth dimension. The Milky Way is not only very large, it's really, really old as well. Just how old brings us back to those globular star clusters that exist mostly in the outer limits of the galactic city. A large focus of my own work is trying to really understand the suburbs of the Milky Way. I don't work right in downtown Milky Way, the galactic center where there may be a massive black hole, or even in the vicinity of the sun where there's a lot of star formation and young stars. I've long been interested in the necrology of the galaxy. I'm looking at the oldest objects that we can see in the far outer halo of the Milky Way. And with a number of colleagues here at the University of Victoria, University of British Columbia, and across Canada and throughout the world, we've been trying to determine the ages of the oldest objects in the universe, the so-called globular star clusters, which are objects which we, of which we see approximately 150 in the Milky Way galaxy. And each one of these globular star clusters may have anywhere from 100,000 to nearly a million stars. We can estimate their ages rather precisely. And from that, we have learned that these oldest star clusters in the galaxy are approximately 15 billion years old. I think that's maybe the most fascinating thing about astronomy these days, that we start by looking out. We see spectacular things. We see distant quasars. We see the Eagle Nebula. We see galaxies. We learn about all of those things. But then in the end, we find ourselves looking back inward and gaining a new appreciation of who we are and where we came from and what our connection with all of that is. And one of the nicest examples of that is actually chemistry. We know enough now to realize that when the universe was very young, that there was hydrogen, there was helium, trace amounts of lithium, and that's about all. But you and I aren't made out of hydrogen and helium and trace amounts of lithium. We're made out of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and phosphorus. And we're, we're sitting here on a planet that has a, an iron nickel core and silicates surrounding it. Where did all of this heavy stuff come from? All of these other elements? And the answer is that they were formed on the insides of stars. Stars get their energy by taking lighter elements and fusing them to form more massive elements. And this process continues. Well, as stars near the ends of their lives, they eject that material. They blow it away in winds. They eject it in planetary nebulae. They go supernova. And so all of that really chemical pollution is what to call it. The chemical legacy of those stars is blasted back out into interstellar space. So that when our sun formed and our earth formed, now you had all of these more massive elements around so that you could do chemically interesting things like build life, for example. If you look around the room, look out the window, the atoms that make up everything that you see were once a part of a star. And in fact, they were formed inside of a star. 
And so you and I are part and parcel with this process. We're the end product, in fact, of the chemical evolution of the galaxy. You know, it's a funny thing about cities. Some of them look bad from nearly any angle. Others, at least from certain angles, look terrific. Now, you may live in a city that tourists just flock to see, or you may come from a place that tourists like to leave behind. But in the cosmic sense, we all live in one of the great scenic beauty spots in the universe. Spiral galaxies are one of nature's most beautiful creations. And all of this, our homes, our cities, our planet, our entire solar system is part of a particularly splendid spiral galaxy called the Milky Way. So why not get away from the city lights some night and check it out? And be sure to join us next time on the Cosmic Highway. <laughs>